Hello again. I hope you're doing fine and that you perhaps have noticed that I posted the adiabatic approximation lecture. So I'm going to finalize this module on time dependent perturbation theory by showing two example problems on how to handle uh, basically correlative transitions from an initial state to a different final state and a connection also very quickly to the adiabatic approximation. So this is considered an appendix to basically this module on quantum dynamics and time dependent perturbation theory. And uh, yeah, it's basically to cause um, this topic, show you how some problems get done, that you get a feeling of the type of calculations that you have to make, and hopefully that um, will be useful for the homework. So let me share the screen. Okay, so again, this is an appendix to time dependent perturbation theory. I'm gonna simply show two example problems. So the first one is the case of basically a constant perturbation and the physical situation is the following. So you start turning on the perturbation then the initial time that we're gonna call t equals zero. And we are gonna turn this perturbation off at a constant uh, time um, t. So t is not gonna be a variable now, but basically indicating the length of the interval uh, over which this perturbation is not zero. But during this interval, precisely zero t, we're gonna assume that the perturbation Hamiltonian is constant, okay? So it basically looks like uh, this square function in a way or basically a rectangular function obtained by adding two heaviside functions. So for this uh, perturbation that it's basically only non-zero and constant during the interval zero t, what we want to do is to calculate the time dependent coefficients because they give us the probability of transition by norm squared, right? And uh, yeah, so well in principle they're related to the time evolution of the wave function, but then we saw that of the first order, um, the square of those coefficients for a different final state, norm squared, they give us a probability of transition. So this was the formula that we obtained from first order approximation in time dependent perturbation theory for the coefficients order one, where we have state K and we also have a state I. And this is the formula for the coefficients where we have to evaluate an integral from zero to t, right? And the integration variable is t prime. And this t is the same as this one, particularly because we're gonna focus on the form of this coefficient precisely at this final time, assuming that the initial time where the perturbation was turned on was precisely time zero. So, um, Again, we know that h prime of t is constant over the interval zero t. Uh, well, basically we can do the substitution and we're restricting precisely to this integration interval. So h prime uh, has a constant value precisely h prime in zero t. And we only have to integrate this exponential where we have uh, used the nickname of omega fi for the Bohr frequency right, that we know the DCK minus CI divided by H bar, when K is F, the final state that we care about, which is different from the initial one. And we want the transition from I to F, or we want to study it. So, uh, so far so good. This is evaluating basically the integral of an exponential, which is quite straightforward to do. We only have to put in the denominator, the constant multiplying the T variable, T prime, and then evaluating between zero and t. And so, well, evaluating at zero gives us one, uh, then evaluating at t, we can get this. And um, we can polish the expression a little bit if we want to kind of like symmetrize it by using exponentials and signs, etc. Basically, we only need to plug uh, out the factor of um, ei omega t over two so here you have basically the exponential of that stuff minus the exponential of minus that stuff. We still have a factor of i that was coming from the integration. 
and we're going to use it because this looks a lot like a sine with a factor of two, right? So here we have the terms that have been untouched so far from the constant Hamiltonian in the interval zero t. Then we have, well, e plus minus e minus divided by i is two times the sine. And then we have a remaining frequency omega phi and then exponential of i omega phi divided by t over two. So as I mentioned, what we saw on uh, the lecture of time dependent perturbation theory and probability of transitions was that these coefficients were useful to calculate the probability of transition to a final state f from the initial state i when f is different. And particularly up to first order perturbation theory, there's an approximation where if you remember, it's basically because we have imposed the initial conditions in the zero order term. So in the first uh, order approximation, the probability of transition is approximately the norm squared of the coefficient up to first order, which is precisely what we have evaluated over here. And then we just simply need to take norm squared of this term. Some of this will disappear because the yeah, this is a complex exponential. Um, so it's norm is one. And then we have a factor of four, norm squared of the matrix element. Then the i won't matter either over here. And then we have uh, in the denominator h bar omega phi squared. And then the sine squared of omega phi t over two. So uh, there are a couple things to mention. Um, I guess one in general and the other specific to this problem. In principle, the probability of transition depends on the norm squared of the matrix element H prime of five. So what we are observing is basically some sort of selection rule um, as we saw in the particular problems for atomic uh, transitions that we studied um, in the development of the lecture. So meaning that in order for this probability of transition to be non-zero, this term has to be non-zero. And so you can interpret this as a selection rule in this problem or a forbidden transition. Um, the other part is that, uh, well, actually for this problem, we can interpret the formula for the coefficients that we were um, obtaining up to here, uh, actually as a Fourier transform. So that is quite neat because, well, on one hand, we know that the Hamiltonian is basically non-zero only in the interval zero t. So it's basically as if, as if you turn on a switch at time equals zero, the switch is on only on the time interval zero t where the Hamiltonian perturbation has a constant value and then it goes off, right? We turn off the switch. So this is precisely the form of H prime. I mean, H prime is basically a constant value over a characteristic function over the interval zero t where it is non-zero and outside this time uh, interval, uh, the perturbation is zero. So I will explain a little bit more in detail in a second presentation. But anyways, I'm gonna substitute uh, in the formula that we have uh, for the matrix element. So this is literally the formula, formula we have from lecture. Um, I'm gonna plug in uh, the particular functional form of the constant perturbation over the interval zero t over here. And precisely because the characteristic function is taking um, the role of determining when you turn on and off uh, things, meaning that it will vanish outside the interval zero t. It is the same to take this interval from zero t to take it from minus infinity to infinity. Because the way the characteristic function is defined, if you remember this or have seen this, the characteristic function over an interval is one when the time t prime is inside the interval and zero when it is not in this interval. So switching the time uh, integration indexes um, is possible by adding this characteristic function so that this interval reduces to this one only over zero t. And again, uh, uh, chi of zero t in t prime is a characteristic function for the interval zero t. And the functional form of our perturbation Hamiltonian is precisely that. It's a characteristic function multiplied by the constant h so that this is only non-zero in the interval zero t, outside this interval is zero, and inside this interval it has the value h because the characteristic function is one where it's non-zero. So, so far so good, we have simply done a mathematical substitution, but the nice part and uh, 
I mean, I want to stress it, but properly, because I don't want to make the argument, which is very hand wavy and I think very loose, that all transition probability coefficients look like a Fourier transform. You have to be very careful on the problem and then indicate when and when not. But anyways, for this problem, um, as you see, well, following from this, we have the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i omega t prime, and then the matrix element, or, well, if you want, I took it outside to basically show the equivalence to this part, but ultimately to this part, right? And t, because it's a constant, it's basically just being a parameter. But if you look at this formula, this is basically a Fourier transform, literal. What you're doing is evaluate the Fourier transform of this term, of this uh, matrix element of H prime at T, well, depending on a parameter T, right? And in this um, interpretation is that we can understand this coefficient uh, as basically a Fourier transform for, uh, well, giving us a frequency uh, component in the direction or in the frequency, sorry omega phi, where t is a parameter. So again, uh, this coefficient is the Fourier transform of, uh, actually I would like to be more proper in this definition. So I would say that actually um, is the Fourier transform of uh, this particular coefficient where I'm gonna also um, plug in uh, if you want this part and just to be very formal into what I'm saying because it's basically the Fourier transform of this matrix element at the frequency omega phi right I mean the difference is that strictly speaking I don't have uh, the Fourier transform at any arbitrary frequency omega but actually at the board transition frequency between the final state and the initial state so but still, probably, yeah, at this point, it's proper to interpret this as a Fourier transform for this element. So, um, well, we know that the transition probabilities are basically the norm squared of these coefficients, right? So, in a way, the probability of transition is higher the more frequency component you have uh, related to this frequency omega phi, uh, understanding basically that the Hamiltonian perturbation is some sort of wave packet, you know? And so, uh, yeah, you can think about it um, that way um, in the sense that, uh, well, maybe I will write this actually. Um, so what you're analyzing is basically this matrix element, you're performing the Fourier transform and then understanding that wave packet in which the term inside it's basically a rectangular function made up by the sum of two Heaviside functions. And if you were to decompose that into sums of frequencies, it's clear that, I mean, there might be a dominant component related to a very large amplitude wave if your uh, interval zero t is very large, for example, and then the smaller contributions of frequencies such that added, they give you uh, the whole rectangular function, right? Like this basically, not a square function, but a step function in a way, or two step functions combined, which are basically the sum of two Heaviside functions. So again, um, this is just stressing that there is some sort of resonance condition uh, hidden in this Fourier understanding of the coefficients, meaning that coefficients uh, for which the Fourier transform is uh, higher um, they will have more probability because they, the probability depends on the norm squared of these coefficients. So this is in a way how the resonance condition is manifesting by means of the Fourier transform of these matrix elements. So, uh, well, I mean, the exercise was done on one hand to get our hands dirty and to show how to calculate the probability of transitions for this example perturbations, such as a constant um, Hamiltonian perturbation the second is to show how to interpret uh, some of these coefficients when the situation mathematically and physically is appropriate as a Fourier transform, right? I mean, essentially for that uh, being a proper interpretation, we need the domain uh, 
uh, of integration to d minus infinity to infinity, which in this case we can do because we think of the switch turned on and off by means of the characteristic function. So we can reduce the integral from zero to t to the integral of minus infinity to infinity with the proper factor. Uh, so, I mean, this uh, concept of the Fourier transform is very um, enlightening, provided you can actually apply it to the physical situation and mathematical situation of, of choice. The second problem I want to discuss, it's um, slightly more complicated which is a Gaussian perturbation, but it's actually gonna have a connection not only with uh, time independent perturbation theory, but also with the adiabatic theorem, which I will comment at the very end. So in this case, we're just gonna assume that the perturbation is basically slowly turned on and off. And the way it is being turned on and off has a Gaussian dependence. So basically the perturbation Hamiltonian looks like this, has a turn B naught, and then the time dependence is captured by this Gaussian um, dependence where you have a time uh, scale. Uh, we're gonna call tau the characteristic time of the perturbation. And well, as you know, for Gaussians, the maximum of this function is at uh, t equal to zero. So here t is not a constant, but actually the uh, variable in the perturbation. And uh, of course, we want to calculate the um, amplitude coefficients and then the probability of transitions by the norm squared of those coefficients. And we're going to justify why in order to do that, instead of taking the integral from zero to t, we have to take it from minus infinity to infinity. This is first of all, because you can think of this problem as if you are kind of like turning on the switch that uh, tau uh, time equal minus infinity. So it takes a long time to be non-negligible, but still that's when you turn on the switch at uh, time minus infinity. And uh, second, I mean, uh, for the Gaussian it's well known that it's basically non-negligible, only close to its maximum and basically mostly um, when you are at a distance from the maximum that it's uh, around the three standard deviations. So in a way, um, for a purpose of non-negligible terms, it doesn't make a difference if you actually take the whole integral for, for minus infinity infinity, which is justified by the physics of the problem and the mathematics as well. So instead of like computing the integral from zero to t, well, we take it from minus infinity because that was strictly speaking our initial time where the perturbation is non-zero and then it's turned off until, um, uh, well, I mean, you could in principle, basically, instead of taking infinity, take T, but assuming that T is uh, big enough, um, it won't make a difference uh, regarding negligible terms to just take the integral up to infinity and uh, it's easier uh, to perform analytical calculations with this domain. So we're just, simply assuming that T is um, big enough so that we can approximate very well uh, this coefficient by taking the integral up to infinity because we don't, we won't be adding too many um, non-negligible terms. So having uh, formulated the integral from minus infinity to infinity, we have again the exponential then the matrix element for H prime uh, if we plug in, basically one of the terms can go outside because it's an integration happening only on time. And the only things that remain to be integrated on in time are the Gaussian dependence and the term related to the board transition frequency. Now, this is a complex exponential. So of course you can use your methods of choice, but in principle, if you want to treat this as a real integral, you would um, expand the complex exponential in cosine plus i sine. And you'll notice that you're integrating from minus infinity to infinity for simplicity analytically. And this is an even function and sine is an odd function and you're integrating over the whole real line. So this integral, the imaginary part is gonna vanish and you're gonna only keep, uh, or the only thing that is gonna be remaining is um, the real part related to the even function cosine. So if you were to do the calculation by using your tables of integrals or methods of mathematical physics or numerical 
uh, actually symbolic integrators that I noticed in the midterm that you are using them, which is okay with me as long as, um, you know, you say it and it's justified and it's reasonable to do so, uh, given the complexity of the calculation. So we can uh, obtain the formula for this integral, which is simply this. So square root of pi tau exponential of minus omega phi squared tau squared divided by four. So um, we have obtained the form for the coefficients. We just have to calculate the approximate value of the probability of transition coefficients, which in this case, uh, we're taking the limit tau or sorry, t going to infinity, partly because of this approximation, but it would be fine. So it's approximately the norm squared of this coefficient. So we have the norm squared of the matrix. Then instead of having a square root of pi, we have pi, then tau squared. Then we have h bar. Uh, pi doesn't appear because we're taking norm squared. And then we have uh, the square of this, which just amounts for multiplying by a factor of two, this stuff. So we have exponential of minus omega phi squared, tau squared divided by two. So on one hand, we could do the same observation regarding forbidden transitions for this problem, et cetera, et cetera. That you already know, I explained it in uh, the previous example and in the other lectures. So I'm not gonna emphasize that. But um, the other interesting part is that, uh, well, the probability depends not only on this factor tau, but also on this Gaussian. So, I mean, one of the possible ways in which this probability of transition could die out, is basically by um, this Gaussian going to zero. And we want to think of the cases where that won't happen to have a non-negligible probability of transition. So in order for this probability of transition to not be close to zero, we basically need that uh, the argument of this Gaussian is of order one, essentially, which means if, um, well, if you know that the time scales defined by the angular frequency and tau was positive by assumption, um, basically this amounts of tau the time scale of the Gaussian perturbation to be of the same order of the time scale defined by the Bohr frequency of transition. That's pretty much what we're finding here. Um, so that's the way the probability of transitions won't be negligible. And I mean, um, that's one way of interpreting it. Um, the other part is that, uh, well, we can also interpret basically the amplitude coefficients as Fourier transforms of the matrix elements as we did last time in this uh, problem. The reason we have integrals from minus infinity and plus infinity were justified on different grounds. Uh, basically that the perturbation dies uh, and starts very slowly. So um, we would have this form, which is justified by this problem. This has all the face of a Fourier transform you're integrating from minus infinity to infinity for, well, considering this frequency when you are taking Fourier transform of this matrix element. Uh, of course, I could substitute the forms, but essentially this is the Fourier transform uh, of this uh, matrix uh, element, uh, H prime F5 for the particularities of our problem where I evaluate at the Bohr frequency of transition omega F5. And of course, in the limit when the parameter time, the time parameter goes to infinity, as in this approximation. So again, the probability of transition from microwave is higher for board transition frequencies, uh, which are more predominant in the wave packet. And uh, well, I mean, this is basically an alternative interpretation of when this term is non negligible. What we have here is in a way, we have computed this Fourier transform since the coefficient in this case is exactly equal to the Fourier transform. And in this case, the probability is approximately the norm squared of this coefficient. So this is representing the Fourier transform and the, this condition is representing the resonance condition that will look in a way in order to uh, have non-negligible probability of transitions. So meaning that the time scale of the perturbation is uh, basically of the order of the time scale of the Bohr frequency of transition. And well, I mean, you could also, if you basically pass to the other side and write this as um, a difference in energies, you could also use your usual uncertainty principle um, interpretations. 
but never mind. Uh, the last comment that I wanted to make is that this problem is also, um, well, can also be interpreted in the light of the adiabatic theorem uh, that we just saw in the previous lecture. Uh, because, well, what will happen if basically we turn on the, uh, the perturbation that is Gaussian very slowly? So basically we have that this is a part, uh, Hamiltonian perturbation and the tau time scale defines how slowly or fast this perturbation is uh, being turned on and off, right? So let's assume that tau is very large so as to make this a very flat Gaussian, right? So basically we're gonna make the perturbation time scale go to infinity so that this um, Gaussian turns uh, into a very, uh, very flat function. Um, I'm gonna be four. Or, well, it's fine. I mean, I was just being formal because I need uh, some normalizing the constant to properly call it a Gaussian, but it's fine. I think everybody understands what I'm referring to. And the limit that I'm gonna take for very large time scale so that the perturbation Hamilton changes very slowly is also such that the product of the time scale with the more frequency goes to infinity. And this is done on purpose because I have already calculated the probability of transition coefficients depending on this Gaussian. And so if the argument of the Gaussian goes to infinity, then this factor is gonna go to zero and then the probability of transition is gonna go to zero. So going back to this, well, I know this is approximate of the first order, then I have the form. And then what happens in the limit when uh, the argument of the Gaussian goes to infinity. Well, in that case, the probability of transition goes to zero. And I'm making an approximation, which is adiabatic actually, because there are two time scales, one defined precisely by the way I turn on and off the um, Hamiltonian perturbation given by the Gaussian. And the other is the time scale implicitly defined by the Bohr transition frequency. And I'm making the assumption that the time scale of the Hamiltonian is much greater than the time scale of um, the Bohr transition frequency, which is inherently uh, inherent to the wave functions in a way. So in this adiabatic approximation, the probability of transition to a different final state is gonna be zero. And because of that, basically the system is gonna remain in its initial state uh, during this transition in this adiabatic limit. So again, what I did is um, presenting in this case a Gaussian perturbation in a way um, up to first order approximations, of course, explaining the behavior of the system, making evident that there were two time scales, and then to study the adiabatic approximation, considering the situation where the Hamiltonian changes so slow, so slowly, then the characteristic time of its change is very large compared to the other characteristic time of the system. And in that case, again, uh, I obtained the uh, consequence of the adiabatic theorem, meaning that I stay in the initial state and I don't change, right? So. Uh, justified by the fact that probability of transition goes to zero in this limit where one time scale is much greater than the other. So I hope this helps to see how you handle these problems in terms of probability of transitions where you're gonna have selection rules particular to these problems related precisely to these matrix elements, uh, making some connections with um, some problems that will appear in your homework and uh, last but not least uh, with the adiabatic uh, theorem. So hopefully this is helpful and the problems will be reasonable um, of the scope of the application examples I just presented. So I hope this helps for your homework, which I will post very soon. And this is actually um, the closing lecture uh, as an appendix of the section on quantum dynamics related to time dependent perturbation theory, uh, theory and the adiabatic theorem. So uh, good luck and talk to you soon.